Vicky's amazing. She wrote a whole dang book on how to contribute to open source and uh, free software and make your life awesome. And um, look at her in her authorly sweater. She's going to answer all your questions. Oh, this is my work Afghan. Um, oh, so it stays on the back of the work thing and work to share when you get cold. Mm -hmm. There you go. I, I do like that somebody just reached out in the chat and said, you guys are live just to let you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, honey, we're like this all the time. Dwayne, yeah, it might, no, um, it's not going to get any different. It's it's just going to be like this. It's going to be like this, yes. Yeah. Uh, but, Dwayne, if you have a question, um, either about Work Afghans or about Vicky's book, um, let's hear it or type it. Yeah, um, so I am I'm taking all questions from people um, specifically about my book, Forge Your Future uh, with Open Source, which I will drop. Actually, so mine says I'm sending just to the panelists. Let me send a chat to and attendees. And attendees. Yeah. Um, Fossforge.com. Um, you can find the book there at Fossforge.com. Um, it's the first and only book about how to contribute to open source software. We didn't have a book all about this before now. Um, and my brilliant and magnificent editor is also sitting here in the chat. So um, I will probably uh, defer to him on specific things if need be. Um, so David, I might poke you at some point to, um, to get uh, Brian McDonald unmuted if needed, but he's not going to want to talk <laughs> so we'll what if there are that. people that want to write books in the in attending i think brian would be a great person to answer that question i also can speak to my personal experiences writing uh books and, and working with the publisher um and working with brian but i liked brian before i wrote a book and i still like him so that's how well the pro the entire writing process went I'm just going to sit here and embarrass Brian the whole time so I don't have to embarrass myself instead. Oh, I like the circle of embarrassment we have going on here. This is mm -hmm. really good. I, I wish I knew more about our other moderator, but. Just a, just a quick logistical thing. I noticed that somebody did put their hand up in the list of attendees. If you do oh. have a question, feel free to stick it into the chat or there's a Q&A section also. I think uh, Deb and VM would be happy yes. wherever you put the question. Yeah. Um, so if you have any questions about what it's like to contribute to open source or how to get started um, or what it was like to write the book or, you know, um, let me see, you can't sign up for the ebook giveaway with a non-US number. So I can answer that one. Um, okay. somebody, somebody gave a suggestion in the last uh, session, which is the rejection hotline number. And so if you, if you have an international number and want a US number, you're welcome. There's also the uh, Rick Astley hotline. <laughs> Wait, Vicky, are you gonna put that in the chat or are you like never gonna give it up? I, I'm never gonna give it up. You know, I, I was going to do that, but I, I have to find it now because I'm never gonna let you down. Thank um, you. That was um, the other end of that joke I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I can only, I can type or I can talk. I can't do both, which is why Deb very kindly offered to help me because I can't really uh, pay attention to what y'all are saying in the chat if I'm answering questions, which means I need some questions. So bring it on, folks. Actually, uh, so the Rick Astley hotline, for those who don't know, is an entire open source project. And there's a link to it in the chat if you would like it. It has uh, numbers for Australia, New Zealand, UK, and the USA, which should probably get you covered if you need a number to enter the book giveaway. So Vicki, can you talk a little bit about like who, um, who you think the audience is for the book? Maybe that'll help people kind of sharpen their question zone. So it was really important to me when I was writing the book that it not be programmer specific. So um, it is, it's applicable to anyone who does anything in open source projects. If you're a writer or infosec or project manager or community manager or programmer, 
um, just anything having to do with an open source project, because in order to have any successful software project, be it open source or otherwise, you need lots of people performing lots of different roles. So the book does not speak specifically to, well, here's the nitty gritty about how to use Git, because a lot of people don't need to know that. And there's adequate information about that already, right? Um, so you don't need me to explain that. You do need me to explain you to you how to find a project, um, you know, how to set your own goals for finding the project, what, what's right for you. Um, all those unwritten social rules around contributing to open source, like why people get their knickers in a twist about spaces versus tabs, things like that. The stuff nobody tells you about until you step across that line and make what they see as a mistake, and then they get really mean to you. So um, the book is for anyone who wants to contribute to open source projects. And uh, it is, uh, it, it was really interesting writing it because every single open source project has a different contribution process, right? Um, you do it this way for OpenStack, you do it that way for Debian, right? It's, it's completely different for every project, big, small, everything like that. But there are some, just some fundamental uh, tenets that are, apply across all of them. Um, and it's actually been really interesting to see how people have used the book not for open source. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Mark Prather, he does uh, software management. So he's a dev manager. He also does project management and scrum master and all that sort of, you know, good organizational people stuff. Um, he says that he recommends this book for all of the remote teams that he uh, works with because he finds it's the best manual on how to coordinate diverse and um, distributed teams, um, which is obviously something that you know, we in open source, we've got a leg up on most of the rest of the world because now everybody's remote and we've done this before, right? I mean, we've worked with people on the other side of the world without having to leave the comfort of our own homes or our own, you know, cafe, not that we go to cafes anymore, but um, you know, so it, it's been really interesting seeing how people apply it in other, in other ways. Neat. Oh, that's it's super cool. Um, we were on one of the um, Community Leadership Summit conversations talking about uh, non-coders and how projects need to have folks that can do different stuff because otherwise you, you know, it, it, uh, people aren't very happy when they're doing the things that they're not very good at and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, I mean, not only are they not happy, but it's just you're going to burn people out, right? If you're expecting yeah the people to both code and do user interface and do accessibility and do technical writing and do infrastructure and do you know release management. You can't expect one small group of people to do all of those things and do it well. Something's going to fall. You're 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 juggling, right? You're juggling a lot of balls and something's going to fall. At that point, you have to figure out how to continue juggling without dropping the balls that are, for instance, made out of glass. Some of them are more important than others. So why don't you just stop juggling and hand everybody a ball? Uh, and, and then you're less likely to get tired of juggling and to drop those glass balls. So, it, and some people frankly aren't good at juggling. Some people are good at, uh, I used to program. It's not something I recommend anyone ask me to do now. Um, I lead software engineering departments um, at like the VP level. I do corporate strategy. I will understand what everyone's doing for programming. But man, there are people who are so much better at that than I am. So work to your strengths. And if you are working to something that's not your strength, like you're being forced to write and you've never really had the opportunity or taken the opportunity to write, then you're not going to create good documentation and you're going to be all frustrated. So give that to somebody who's better at it. Then your users are happy and you're happy and your tech writers are happy and then you know, everyone's happy. Why don't you bring on more people to do this? So that's what the book tries to help you do is you know how can you get involved to do that and make everyone happy? And it's one of the biggest steps I think towards uh, open source sustainability, which is what your talk, your panel was about earlier. Um, yeah, I, we I did talk about that. it. Yeah, for about that long before the entire online conferencing thing just got too frustrating to me. And then I went to work on my slides instead for my talk tomorrow. <laughs> um, so uh, it, what's your talk on tomorrow? Tomorrow, my talk is the basics of copyright and licensing for software developers. Excellent. Um, 
and it is based on some of the content that's in the book uh, that's expanded a bit more. I'm going to try and keep it down to like 35 or 40 minutes in the 45 minute mm -hmm. slot so I have some time for Q&A. But there's a lot to cover there, even with just the basics. Um, it's Would you complex. recommend your book to lawyers that are working in the open source space for the first time? Oh, heck yes. Um, lawyers and uh, business people. I, I work in the business space, right? Corporate strategy. So um, recommend it to them. Recommend it to uh, students, teachers, and project maintainers. Um, mm -hmm. So each of these groups can get something different out of it but it all kind of comes down to perspective. So what can you get? Uh, how can you understand the people on the other side of the equation? If you're a business person trying to use or contribute to or release open source software, you probably don't understand open source. That's what I find with the vast majority of the companies I work with. They just, they mean well, but they don't understand. And I have another talk that's uh, you know, entering the open source emerging market where you're going somewhere where there's a different culture, there's a different language. And if you don't take the time to understand that, you're going to fall flat on your face and you're going to screw up and then um, everybody's going to be angry. You don't want that. So to minimize the anger, learn more about that space that you're entering into and learning how to contribute is a really good way to walk a mile in someone else's shoes. So that's really good. Um, for project maintainers, if you read the book, you can get a better sense of what a contributor might be looking for. So how can you make your project uh, more welcoming to people to, to come and contribute to your project so you can kind of, uh, you can allow more people to help and if more people are helping, that means you have to do less, which means you don't have to get woken up at like 3 a.m. when the site falls over. You know, you've got someone else on the other side of the world who can do that in the middle of the day, right? You don't have to get burned out doing everything on your project. You can make it a more welcoming space so more people will come and contribute and then you don't get burned out. Um, and, you know, it's really a much more sustainable way to have an open source ecosystem. What's like a small example of something that you think people... Like they were maybe weren't doing it on purpose, but it wasn't very welcoming. And then when you say it in the book, it's like, ah, oh, aha. Oh God, uh, I, I, I'm really bad at exact examples unless I've had a chance to uh, think it oh. through in advance. Um, and I would probably end up naming and shaming and I don't like doing that. Uh, cool, well you won't do that because ladies on the internet don't need any of that. So, um, Cool. Uh, let's go back. Uh, we'll zoom back out again. Uh, pun intended? I don't know. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, so uh, can you, what do you think is one of the, th like, what do you think is like different about the open source sector than like other sectors? So if people were coming from another work sector, like, what do you think is like kind of the biggest thing that is hard to get your head around when you come here to open source? Um, so when I work with companies around open source, uh, the one thing they have a really hard time with is relinquishing control and uh -huh. allowing and playing well with others. Uh, they're used to keeping everything within their four walls, so to speak. Um, yeah. you know, so you don't share information outside. You don't speak with others. You don't solicit feedback outside of your little bubble, except in very, uh, very discreet ways, such as you get your marketing team to go out and do some market research and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. you aren't really putting it all out there. Um, and that makes a lot of companies very, very afraid. Um, they're afraid mm -hmm. that they will get raked over the coals, that they will get mocked, that they will potentially release something they should not, um, intellectual property, um, that they might release something that's insecure, that the quality of their code or their project will be lacking. Um, and what I find is that almost all of this is, um, it's based in historical things that we have done um, as free and open source software people and as just an industry, right? Um, we can lay a lot of this, unfortunately, at the feet of Microsoft back in the you know, 90s and early 2000s. Um, they have done a 180 degree turn and they, they now understand and they get it um, and they're shifting in a really authentic way. So yay, Microsoft, I, I'm legitimately cool. thrilled with the direction they are taking free and open source software now. Um, 
So there's that, but there's also we in, in free software and open source, we have done a really good job of driving people away by being assholes, frankly. Um, and we are real jerks about anyone who steps across these invisible lines that we can see, but no one else can. And then we treat them like crap. And so companies are afraid of that and they're afraid of getting mocked and, and um, yeah. they're afraid of getting, you know, put on hacker news for something they accidentally misstepped and suddenly they've got a PR nightmare um, rather or than- was it, um, was it Slashdot that had the image of the Borg as a, for every single Microsoft story for like 15 years or something? Yeah, exactly. They just never let up. I mean, they you know, like the old Microsoft may have deserved a lot of that, but like, yeah, it, it, it didn't exactly say like, you're welcome here. Exactly. We're, we weren't welcoming and we aren't, um, we in software, we're really big on blameless postmortems now, right? Something goes wrong. You don't point fingers. You try and figure out what went wrong and you fixed it um, because it's typically not human error. If there's one error that can happen caused by a human, that's not the human's fault. It's the system's fault. And so you have to fix the system, not blame the human. So we do that in our software but we don't do that in our culture. And so what we have are a lot of people making mistakes because we've done a very bad job of, of educating them and helping to reach out to them and understand their perspective and getting them to understand ours, right? And doing that translation layer, we don't do that well. And so it drives a lot of people away, both, um, both individual contributors and also companies. Uh, companies also, therefore, you know, they end up not knowing how to do these things. So if they want to do it because it's trendy and it's popular, and sorry, folks, it is trendy and popular to be participating in open source right now, they want to mm -hmm. be there. And if we're not showing them how to do it, I'm sorry, they're just going to make their shit up as they want, right? And they're going to try and figure it out as best they can. And if we're not there to help them, and provide guidance, then yeah, they're going to make missteps. But that frankly is our fault for setting up a system where they can make the mistakes. So we can do a lot better at that. Um, there are other things that they can do internally that they should be doing just as for like clean code. Um, you know, always be looking at your your code to make sure you're not committing your AWS credentials. You know, always be looking at your stack to make sure you're not using out of date open source components. Otherwise, you know, you're just one bad day away from being the next Equifax, right? Always be looking at- <laughs> No one wants those, that. <laughs> right, those are just standard things that you should be doing anyway as a business, but I find most companies aren't. They don't even know what their entire open source uh, supply mm. chain is, let alone, you know, which pieces of that chain, which links to that chain are weak. We can do a whole lot better there uh, as an industry and as open source. We have a question. I'm so excited. Is it, do folks have questions for Vicki? So There's Tanisha one in Q&A. Uh, as a oh, new Salesforce yeah. programmer, would this book help me navigate how to contribute and create projects in open source? Tanisha, excellent question. Um, so this will have nothing to do with Salesforce specifically. Um, you do have an open source program office in Salesforce and I encourage you to seek them out and they'll be able to help you. Um, but as far as contributing to open source, yes, this book is specifically about that. So it'll absolutely help with that. So, um, so I encourage you to check it out, but I also encourage you to check your employment agreement and speak with your open source program office, because if you are intending to contribute to open source projects and you are uh, doing it with or for Salesforce, um, you should make sure that you are not uh, you're not accidentally contributing something that your your employer has copyright over. Um, and this is something that I cover in my talk tomorrow, which is I know like two thirty Eastern time. Um, and I, it's a uh, it's a basic introduction to copyright and licensing, um, which is very fundamental. Uh, it's, it is the thing that underlies and makes open source so successful. Without it, you know, we can't really, if you don't understand that, you can't do open source very well. Um, but yeah, the book will generally help you how to learn how to contribute to projects. It would also help you select a project. 
um, which is something that I get a lot of questions about. How do I even find a project? Well, there are millions, literally millions of projects out there. So there's lots of good stuff where you can contribute um, and lots of projects that will need your help. So uh, there's an entire chapter just on how to find the right project for you. Because if you just pick the first one that comes along because it's really popular, say Linux, which is the one everyone wants to contribute to because everyone knows it, right? Top of mind. Um, it's really hard to contribute to Linux. So I don't recommend you start there. That's, that's you know, like starting a video game on the ultimate hard mode and going directly to the end boss. That's what it's like to start contributing if you're just going directly to Linux. Um, so I recommend you not do that. Find something smaller and more approachable and most importantly, something that's of interest to you that you already know something about. I don't know what your hobbies are, Tanisha, but it could be, um, I, I knit, I, I sew, I do um, a lot of fermentation stuff. Um, so I, I've got a lot of other hobbies, but there are projects for all of this. For instance, there's freesewing.org, which is a free software project where you can go to there and enter your measurements and it will spit out a pattern specifically for your size and your measurements. Um, and it's great and it's all free software. So I can go and I can contribute to that. And I already know the domain. I know about say seam allowances and I know about grain lines and different things like that. So I can read the code and it makes a lot more sense to me because I already understand the language. So it's, I would be more successful contributing to freesewing.org than I would on something for instance for um, automotive or um, let's say another one I'm looking into is uh, home automation. I don't know anything about that yet. There's a lot of things that you need to know about HVAC and electricity and lights and stuff that I don't know that yet. So um, a lot of impedance. Else. Yeah. In <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, you're not. I'm not. <laughs> this is why I have Deb here because she helps make everything better. Do you think, uh, Vicki, that uh, picking something that's related to your hobby instead of your work is more likely to be okay with your employer? For many employers, yes. If you're able to find an open source project that um, has absolutely nothing to do with what they uh, do for a living. Um, for instance, you, let's say you're working for a large cloud provider. Hmm. There's at least three from which you can select. Um, let's say you're but if you work at one, you shouldn't contribute to the other without telling your boss. Exactly. Um, you shouldn't contribute to anything without telling your boss because mm -hmm. they, depending upon your employment agreement, they might own the copyright over everything you produce. If it's on their time or if it's on their equipment or if it's both and sometimes even outside of that. So you have to check your contract, you have to check your employment agreement. And regardless of any of that, you always have to tell them just to make sure, because if you don't, you're going to land yourself in a lot of hot water from a, a, um, a legal perspective. I can guarantee your company can afford a better lawyer than you can. So just yep. take a few minutes and verify your contract, verify your employment agreement and ask them, speak to your manager and say, hi, I would like to contribute to freesewing.org. Is that okay? And do it in an email and or so you have documentation. Yes, always get this stuff in writing. Um, and once you get that in writing, like CC your personal email address so you have it in a different place because you always want to do a CYA, um, that's a cover your ass CYA um, with anything involving- We've already stuff. said ass once, I think we're, yeah. Yeah, ass shit. Um, I'll just, I, I'll run through <laughs> all of them if you want, but I am trying to keep this relatively, you know, PG-13. Um, Vicki, do you think there's also like some, like an, as opposed to just lawsuit and avoidance, which is its own good, do you think there's also some benefits to telling your employer that you're interested in expanding your skill set by contributing to open source? See, I knew I got the right friend to help me with this. Um, yes, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that open source, one of the many things open source can do for you is help you move forward in your career. Um, it, you can learn new skills. If you don't know technical writing now, you can learn it there. You can learn how to program in a new language. You can learn project management skills. You can learn all of these great things. And that's awesome. 
but it's not going to help as much if you don't tell your your employer that you're actually doing this. It's like, hey, look, I'm doing this cool stuff. So when you're one on ones with your manager, as you are working on your yearly goals or however your company does that, you know, make sure to mention, I want to contribute to open source. Here are the things I want to get out of it. That presupposes, mm. of course, you have done the thinking of what you want to get out of it. And um, this is something that a lot of people, you know, it, it's, you know, what do I want to get out of contributing to open source? It's like the question is made out of Teflon. People will ask it and then their brain slides right off, right? They just, they, <laughs> they don't want to think about that because I should be contributing to open source because it's cool, because, you know, altruism, giving back is the right thing to do. Well, it's okay to get something out of it. And actually you're more likely to be successful and to stick with it if you can see the benefits of it. It's like if you start any sort of new hobby, if, if, you start, you know, this is one of the first things I knit. If you know anything about knitting, um, it's very, very simple. It's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. The exact same stitch for about seven, eight feet um, on really big needles. It was really easy, but 20 years later, I'm still wearing this thing and I'm still knitting because I had this success that I'm able to look at. Right. And that was really great to be able to do that. Same thing with open source or any other endeavor. You want an easy success. You want an easy win. Mm -hmm. Right. So try and get something that you know you're going to be successful at. Um, and then you can use that to springboard and continue forward on your goals. And I think I lost the thread there. Well, uh, I was going to ask you, because you talked a lot about like specific tangible skills, but say you work somewhere you don't like very much, like is meeting a bunch of folks at an open source project, like good for your career network? You're just feeding me all the yes, yes. <laughs> I'll try and think of something it hard, I don't know. No, 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 I mean, you're, you're, you're keeping me, uh, you're covering all this stuff I ought to be talking about, but I wouldn't if I were just left to my own devices, which is why I knew- Can I write so the blurb on the this? back of your next book then? Uh, probably yes. Okay, Brian, please write the uh, take a note for that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so noted. Yay! <laughs> I love my BMAC. Um, so uh, yeah, if if you're in a job that you don't like, um, mm -hmm. take a look at your career. I mean, take a look at the job and see why you don't like it. It could be that your manager sucks, but it could be that the work sucks. It could be that you have ethical problems with some of the stuff your company is doing, and you need to get out. Um, yeah. You know, there are any number of reasons. Maybe you need to move to a different part of the world. Maybe you need to, more money to take care of your family, more time to take care of your family. Maybe you have a lot of crunch time. You know, there's plenty of reasons why you want to leave a job. Um, so look at where you want to go. Um, where do you want to go in your career? Are you, for instance, in customer support right now, which by the way, we need an open source. We need people to help answer questions in uh, issues and bug reports. So if you're in customer support, please contribute to open source because um, answering questions in bugs is a contribution. Um, you know, if you're in customer support and you want to become a programmer, figure out where you can start doing that. You know, start to learn a little bit about JavaScript, which is one of the most popular programming languages in the world. Learn a little bit about JavaScript and then find a project that uses JavaScript and then start to make little contributions and uh, use things like exorcism.io Yes. Oh, there we go. Um, to help practice what you're doing. And then you can learn uh, more about not only how to do it, but you can network and you meet all these people all over the world. And what, when those people have jobs that they need to fill, they're going to go to the projects that they use in their company. And if you're one of the people who contribute to that project, you're more likely to hear about that job before someone else. And they're more likely to hire you because they know your work because you've already been working in the open and they can see it. But also, they already know that you know their stack. You already know this JavaScript library that we rely on in our company. We're more likely to hire you. Um, oh, I just put in your, put, Brian said, uh, David said to remember the book giveaway. And I said, you have a whole talk about running a healthy job hunt, which is one of your other things that you're ex excellent at. Um, that, yeah, that's a four hour workshop. So 
full disclosure, it, that's an investment in time, but it's in four chunks. So you don't have to sit down and work. But if you're unemployed, like maybe you've got a little time for that. Um, uh, so Vicky, like how do you have any like specific advice for someone who's been doing open source as a volunteer and how they might like start to chip into getting paid for it? Like how do you get over that hump? Like it's one thing to be like at a one company that you do tech at. They're like, well, you know, I could be at another one that doesn't, you know, support morally murky stuff or whatever. But uh, how do you get from like, oh, no one's ever hired me to like for tech to someone is going to hire me? So do you mean getting hired to specifically work like on your open first source? Like your first open source job? Um, that depends. Um, so as far as first open source job, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily get to define that. There are Ah. While open source is really, really popular and free software to open source is used in nearly 100% of the software that is out there today, right? So it's incredibly popular and it is under, it is, you know, it underpins everything that we do and use that involves software, your car, your toaster, fucking everything uses free and open source software, right? Um, but you might not get paid to contribute to that to these uh -huh. projects. And that depends upon your employer, whether they are willing to do that. Now, there are ways to speak to your employer to, to try to get them to do that. But the first step is always see what their initial processes and policies are. Most companies don't have written down policies around this yet, um, mm. but some do. So have a look and see whether they have that. Um, and then you have to make a business case for why it is worth them investing their, your time, which means their money in this project. So don't just go in there saying, hey, this is an open source project that we use. I think I should contribute to it. Tell them mm -hmm. why it is worth that for them. This is a business. They have to, they need a business case for all these things, not just because it's the right thing to do. Um, show them how this is going to be worth it for them. We're going to land these patches that are critical to these, um, these features we're planning to add in the next year. We're going to fix these security holes before they bite us in the butt. We're going to um, be able to influence the future direction of this project. You know, there, it all depends on what makes sense for your company and how you can push the right buttons, right? What is important to your company, strategically speaking? Um, figure out what that is. So you can see whether your contribution to this project actually fits in there, because it might not. As far as you know, getting paid full time mm -hmm. to do it, there mm -hmm. are some projects or some companies out there that will do it. I um, used to lead a team at Hewlett Packard Enterprise that was 100% dedicated to upstream open source development. That's all the team did was just work on projects that the company relied on. There are teams mm -hmm. out there like that. They are few and far between. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and a lot of the times you'll find that uh, I have personally found that these are more in um, enterprise companies, enterprise, you know, big, big companies will dedicate a team just for that. Um, there are also some companies that are called open core. And this is very, very popular lately with those that get VC funding. Um, mm. So lots of startups are going open core because they didn't learn from the 90s and figure out that, you know, freemium, the freemium business model doesn't actually pay your bills. But aside from that, they exist. And what open <laughs> core means is we have an open source core to our project or to our product. Product is what you sell. Project is the open source thing that you release. So we have an open source project at the core of our proprietary pro product. And so we have these add-ons that are value adds that people can buy like extra support or here's professional services or here's you know better monitoring or here's you know whatever right it all depends mm -hmm. on the product you can get paid to work on that open source project that is the core you also have to work on all the proprietary stuff more like but you can get paid to work on that one thing in the open um, so that's pretty popular and you can do that as well. Uh, but there are other companies that will just, you know, pay you to say, uh, we rely on Debian. So we need somebody who is a Debian expert. Can you come on board? 
embed yourself in the Debian project and, and then help us be better at Debian internally. Um, there's not a lot of these, but they do exist. So you have to do a lot of searching. What about um, different programming languages? Like if you were starting to just poke at a programming language, what are a couple that you think probably have a higher chance of leading to an open source job? Um, Fortran? So I, uh, you know, actually Fortran underpins almost all, you know, it, it's Fortran is used by the Python uh, data munging uh, libraries. Oh. It, it actually is underneath all of those things. And I think Apple might be really removing Fortran from its its operating systems in future versions or something like that. Anyway, I saw a big hmm. kerfuffle about, oh my God, lots of Python uh, data science libraries aren't going to work anymore because they're really removing Py uh, Fortran. So Fortran is still really good in some areas if you want to do um, uh, uh, science. Sci it's still used in the sciences a lot, but it depends on what you want to go into, right? Everything has its own special delicate snowflake. We prefer this. If you are moving into the Google in, um, ecosystem. Array manipulation. Uh, array story. manipulation. Yes. Um, I, that's for tranny stuff. Um, if you want to work in the Google ecosystem in some way, mm -hmm. you'll probably want to learn Go. If you want to move into the Android ecosystem, you will want to learn Kotlin. Um, if you want to work just generally in the back end of lots of things, or you want to work in data science or AI ML, so um, artificial intelligence and, and uh, machine learning, you will probably want to learn Python. Python is one of the uh, most quickly growing languages and has been for a very long time. It's also one of the most popular languages. JavaScript, you can't go wrong with JavaScript. Everyone needs it. Python, everyone needs it, um, but there's nothing wrong with any language. So use the one that calls to you. Uh, when I did program, I programmed in Perl. Perl really speaks to me really well because it's written by a linguist. Larry Wall really loves mm. human languages. And when I read Perl, it makes so much sense to me, but I have a language background in classical philology. And so ancient Greek and Latin, I, I read Perl and it, it makes sense to me because it reads more like human language to me than others do. Uh, the others make sense to me, but Perl makes the most sense. So, you know, go yeah. with what works for you because there are, there are definitely, um, uh, you know, there are jobs out there in, in every single language. It just depends on what you want to do. So figure out the area you want to try and see what language those tools are written in and then learn that language. Vicki, do you have advice on how to find friendly communities? Like you said, don't just pick the first one and to pick something that uh, maybe calls to you or has something to do with one of your hobbies, but how do you find like a, a friendly community? Um, well, I mean, obviously you have to start with the bigger pool of, you know, all the things that are interesting to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then look at all of the projects that, you know, kind of pull your chain a little bit. It's like, oh, that's, that's ringing my bell. Let me look at that one. Let me look at that <laughs> one. Um, step one is to see whether they have a code of conduct. Uh, so a code of conduct is probably going to be just a markdown file or whatever in their project repository. It'll be linked on their website, you know, whatever that project uses to share its information. If it doesn't have a code of conduct, then, I mean, this is table stakes at this point, but um, there are lots of projects that uh, where people have resisted code of conducts. We should just be excellent to each other. And we're just going to say that. Um, and unfortunately, what excellent means varies by person to person. So having a code of conduct really sets out, this is not welcome, that is not welcome, this is fine, that is not. And it makes it a lot clearer that the project has done a lot of thinking about how to make it a welcoming space for everyone. So a project that hasn't done that is, um, and hasn't committed to that in writing by putting a code of conduct out there might not be a safe space for you. It might be, it might be perfectly fine, but you know, if you have other options, go with the other option, because you really don't want to put yourself to that position where you might be, you know, belittled, you might be, uh, someone might be biased against you because of your gender identity or your racial identity or, you know, the fact that you came from, uh, you're a self-taught programmer or anything like, or that you're not a programmer at all. 
right? So try to, if you can, see whether you can find something that has a code of conduct. Um, and then lurk a little bit. Um, and by that, I mean, don't just dive in and automatically start contributing. Spend some time in the community, you know, join their mailing lists or, or their IRC channel, or if they use it, you know, go to Slack or Discord or whatever that is uh, they happen to use. Um, and, you know, see how people interact. Are they mean to each other? Uh, do they support each other? Do they um, answer questions? quickly and appropriately, uh, you know, and see how they interact before you start to commit yourself. Because if uh, you get into a community that is always just sort of snippy and backbiting on each other, that might not be a good experience for you. And it might not be the most supportive place for you as a new contributor. So see whether there might be someplace else where you can um, invest your time. And it really is an investment in time. It's worth remembering that if you are, you're doing this probably on your free time. Maybe you're getting paid for it. Good on you, mate, if that's happened. But um, if not, this is your free time. You don't have a lot of that. And once you spend it, it, it is gone, right? You, you don't <laughs> want to just spend that on anything. You want to spend that where it's going to make a difference and where you can get something out of it. It'd be, even if that's something, be enjoyment rather than moving your career forward. So don't, don't try not to spend it on, you know, worthless crap. That's just going to make you feel bad. Um, you know, sometimes we all need the Reese's peanut butter cups and potato chips, right? Fine. But if you eat a complete diet of that, you're going to feel like crap. And that's what joining a bad open source project is like, where they're not welcoming and supportive. You don't want to feel like crap afterward. Well, and also, as you mentioned before, like building your career network, like, I mean, picking a dysfunctional project is a great f way to find a new dysfunctional boss. So. Yes. Oh, that is you so know. well. Somebody tweet that. And, and <laughs> Deb is at bacon and coconut on Twitter. <laughs> I just want yeah. to jump in just for one second. I'm, I'm, I apologize. Yes, we've please. Got a, we've got a few minutes left before the scheduled end of the session, but we can go yeah. a little bit long. Um, I just wanted to solicit the audience to see if anybody else had any particular questions. You know, very, very interactive session. So we'd love to have you post them in the chat. Uh, or in the Q&A, but uh, don't let me interrupt. Please continue. Um, no, I mean, Deb's been doing such a great job, but I, I am very cognizant of the fact that nobody's been asking questions. Um, does anyone want to know what it's like to write a tech book or to pitch a tech book or anything like that? Anyone interested in that? I'm actually curious if the attendees are coming at this from, you know, like an established contributor perspective, or if they're actually mm. just curious, how can I contribute, even if I'm not a software developer? Um, if, if there's any feedback from people in the audience about that. Yeah, no, that that's, uh, that's a great question, David. Is it David or Dave? You know, there's so many Daves and Davids that I've given up on uh, choosing one or the other. Whenever there's two uh -huh. of us, I'm they get their preference and I'm the other one. So so go uh -huh. nuts. <laughs> and, the, and the nuge is already taken. So Th that's it's, there's that's there's, probably a good thing. Yeah, you know, there's some famous people named Nugent that I don't uh, associate with too strongly. So for what it's worth, one of my dearest friends um, has a a dual last name, and one of those is Nugent. So when I saw your name, I was like, oh my gosh, yay. So I'm predisposed to like you because of that. Love it. <laughs> um, so do we have no questions from the audience or nobody want to chime in about, you know, where they're coming from as far as uh, uh, contributing to open source? Oh, we have two from Q&A now. You know, maybe they're, lurk they're lurking just to see what the question format should be like. Oh, how do you zero in on a topic to write about? And then I'll read oh. the other one. Um, that's a, so this is a book uh, for a book. Yes, Tanisha? Is it Tanisha or Tanisha? I'm going to go with Tanisha. And apologies at, if I mispronounce it. Um, how do you zero in on a topic? Well, it, I can tell you how I zeroed in on a topic. Uh, and then we can kind of spin off from there. So how I zeroed in is that Brian came to me and he said, Andy Hunt, who uh, is the publisher of Pragmatic Bookshelf, published my book. They're wonderful, wonderful place. Um, 
I pronounced it right. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, so Andy Hunt, Br Brian came to me and said, Andy Hunt thinks there ought to be a book about how to contribute to open source. What do you think? And I was like, well, yeah, of course there should be a book to contribute. To open source. <laughs> um, that was your first said, mistake. Great. You got to write it, right? And uh, this is, of course, all paraphrased uh, because Brian <laughs> would never present it in that way. But uh, I hemmed in hard and thought about it a little bit. Um, so have it, coffee with Brian? Is that that's what I'm hearing? I, I think it was IRC with Brian. Um, Ooh, since wow. I, I think I was in Manchester at the time, uh, Manchester, UK, and um, oh, for Crystal's event, the Free Node Live. Uh, no, that was Bristol. Oh, uh, Man Manchester was uh, Floss UK, I think. Huh. Um, I was keynoting Floss UK. Uh, Manchester is a great industrial city. I really enjoyed it. Really nice art museum. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and Brian said, hey, pretty much 100% how it happened. Would you like to do this? And I was like, a book? Are you kidding me? Um, and I thought about it. And what brought me around to doing it, because I scared, absolutely petrified of writing a book. Um, two things brought me around to doing it. Number one, we didn't have a book about how to do this and we were about 40 years overdue okay not mm -hmm. quite 40 years probably 35 years overdue for that um so um i i felt that needed to happen and i was qualified to do it um even though i was petrified and the second reason i said yes is that i got to do it with brian um and i knew that he would be there to help support me and that he really really knew his stuff um and i honestly could not have done this without Brian's help. So he's going to be all modest about it. And he's probably blushing right now over there in uh, Pennsylvania, but um, he's wonderful and I couldn't have done that. Now, as far as what you want to do, right? If you want to write a book, look at the things that interest you and look at the questions and the problems that you've solved. And it could be that the problems you're solving are problems other people are having that you can then share with them. Um, and you can do it either in an article, you can do it in a talk. And if there's enough there, you can do it in a book. But it's, I think, really important. And this is my bias showing because I do write for Pragmatic Bookshelf um, that it be pragmatic and it be useful it not just be a here is my memoir of something i did right well that's, that's a different not, book exactly that's a totally yeah. different book um and it might be interesting and entertaining but it's not going to help people get something done so what can you do to help people accomplish their goals right mm. um like i could have just written a random book about open source and that would have been a decent book but targeting specifically here is how you contribute to open source is actually much more useful. So look for something useful. And, um, and we have one more happens. question, Vicki. I don't know if you want to get to that one before we oh. let everyone go. Um, Savannah Self says, I have experience as an analyst slash curator for ontologies, and I have an extracurricular interest in open source. I think they go together very well, but it's not like any of that is really a job title, and I would like to further my path in that. How would you recommend finding a, co a community to lurk? Oh, wow. Um, so ontologies, that's going to be more in, I'm going to put you in the glam space. Um, uh, mm. uh, Savannah. So, um, Glam, for those of you who don't know. Um, Galleries, libraries, archives, archives and museums. And, museums. Um, and I also often add uh, Glamza. So, galleries, libraries, archives, museums, zoos, and aquariums, because these are all really open <laughs> spaces. Um, uh, so, there are lots of open source projects around Glam. Um, for libraries and archives and cataloging and things like that. So um, look up some of those and see whether your skills might be useful. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they will. There's not enough people who are uh, who have your skills, frankly, at all in the world. So thank mm -hmm. you. Um, but in general, uh, I think that's someplace where you might see something that you understand and you might be able to chip in a little better. Uh, so you'll understand a bit more of the uh, domain rather than just diving into, for instance, um, open source governance, which is something that uh, a project that I released recently, um, which is- On Zotero, which itself is like a 
ontology, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and it's some, a problem that I'm going to be resolving um, for Fo the FOSS Governance Collection soon. Um, so the FOSS Governance Collection is exactly what it says on the tin, a collection of governance documents for free and open source software projects. Because every time you have a question, it's like, well, how do I do my voting? I don't know, how does everyone else do it? You have to go and do a billion and one web searches. Well, how about you just go to one website and look at all the documents tagged voting? Well, that tagging is an ontology. Um, and before I'm able to open up contributions to other people in Zotero, I need to figure out how to standardize the ontology so we all can be using the same tagging for, for these documents. Now that's a problem that I have already with just this one project that I've released. Other projects have this as well and they might not know it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. finding projects that are working on, for instance, their documentation Mm -hmm. um, the Drupal documentation project is excellent and they really help people land new uh, patches. So that might be a place where you can help with their um, categorization, and their cataloging of their projects. Um, OpenStack also has really good documentation project. There are lots of projects out there. Um, and Write the Docs is a really good place to find projects that are working on their documentation. Um, and Read the Docs is the open source project that is that is behind the write the docs uh, 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 just community. I guess it is a big community. So there are places where you can go for that. Um, so um, if you have any other questions for any of that, y'all y'all can feel free to drop me. Which email am I using for this conference? Um, y'all can just drop me an email. Um, they're at ato2020 at vmresor.com. Um, if you have specific questions, and I'll see what I can do to, to help point you in the right direction on um, this sort of stuff. Um, but also, you know, if you're going to be getting involved, I do encourage you to check out the book and have a look at it. Um, uh, please sign up for the free book. Uh, David, do you want to drop the link in there again? Oh, um, yeah, the book link one more time. Yay, where is it? Uh, I don't know how many free also, copies. I, oh. I just pasted David, it in there. I am in. not sure exactly how many free copies are out there, but I really hope all of you get it. This has actually been one of the uh, best attended sessions that I've been hosting today. So um, fill out that link as soon as possible. But um, all right. logistically, I know that we should probably end soon just so that we yeah. can get our next speaker up. Uh, Derek Weeks is going to be talking about feedback loops. But I've had such an amazing time listening to your conversation back and forth, Deb and VM. I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been great being a, a fly on the wall here. And I hope that if the audience has more questions, that they can reach out to you by, uh, by email. Absolutely. Um, I could not have done this without Deb. Um, this would have just been me sitting here babbling about random crap for you know 50 minutes or whatever so deb you are amazing yeah, i'm glad i'm glad that you changed the title of your book from babbling about random crap for uh, 200 pages the, the, the new one's awesome <laughs> you know that's, that probably, title. that's probably due to brian right <laughs> we can we can thank brian for that one i'm sure uh yeah that the, the title was an ordeal um <laughs> Someday over coffee, I'll tell people all about that. <laughs>